Wow, that was that was a lot, wasn't it? Hello, I'm Emmett Ryan, and wow, what a summer it has been. I mean, there have been so many transfers, it's been hard to keep track. In fact, there have been so many transfers, we've kind of overlooked some. So in this video today, I'm going to discuss them. The headline makers, the ones that have been overlooked, and also why we've seen this absolute mad rush, really, across EuroLeague in particular, to upgrade what they have. So let's get to it. So this is Emma from earlier, and I forgot to tell you all to subscribe. So please do that now, and it really helps the channel. So there's been a lot, but the story, it kind of has to begin in Athens slash Piraeus, where it was almost like, anything you can do, I can do better. So there was Vazenkov, and then there was, of course, Yurtsevin. Vazenkov back to Olympiakos, Yurtsevin to Panathinaikos. So, of course, Panathinaikos goes, well, we can't let that slide, can we? So they go and sign Evan Fournier. And, like, Fournier obviously was in a case of, not too dissimilar to Vazenkov in that he wanted to be on a team where he could be in a position to win. Uh, Vazenkov obviously felt he wasn't either going to contribute to a team that could do that or be on a team that could do that. Uh, Fournier felt that he was only getting offers. In fact, the Wizards was his main offer from teams who were going nowhere. So for both of them, that was an obvious case. The Turkish double, because obviously once Fournier was signed, then of course the Shetty Osman new news broke. We have a Shetty Osman video somewhere there. And yeah, uh, you know, that all went kind of crazy. So we're like, Shetty Osman to Panathinaikos. It's all a bit mad when you think about it. So there's been all that, but of course, I'm doing a video couple of days ago, recording it, getting it all together, all breaking down the Fenerbahce roster, which I thought was a really interesting roster and deserved a roster breakdown. And two hours after I finished what I think is the final video, it required an emergency Boban edit. Because, of course, Boba Marjanovic, for two reasons, is the huge headline grammar. Wo grabber. One, obviously, Boban is a larger-than-life personality. He's obviously a giant of a man in literal sense. But like the personality of Boban has somehow gotten even bigger than Boban himself is. Uh, so when you have those two combinations, he's naturally going to get a lot of attention. And his move to Fenerbahce, while probably not as influential as some of the other moves, got us all talking. As all of us all go, oh yeah, Boban, wow, he's back. And obviously he's shredded, uh, my word. Uh, although he was pretty great looking going into last season. So people don't know how shredded Boban looks now. He wasn't that different last offseason either folks before it's like what is now his final year with the Rockets and of course the other one which sort of dominated the headlines was the entire partisan roster like there were so so many of them uh, that came in which kind of had us all losing track of the sheer number of big names they were coming in so that kind of means though with all this movement there were some big moves both from the NBA and within EuroLeague and also from coming outside that kind of got overlooked. So now we're going to talk about the overlooked guys. And I just mentioned how Partizan were so much hype with their, you know, massive, fantabulous roster announcement. You can see my piece about the Partizan signings up there with a roster breakdown. But also, uh, let us not forget that we kind of, with so many, we forgot just how thorough it was. Obviously, Frank uh, coming over was huge. Poku was back in Europe. The arrival of Carlick Jones in Europe, which is going to be great. There's Ify, there's Isaac, there's so many. The sheer volume of moves made by Partizan meant that analyzing them individually almost became the challenge in itself. But the other ones that I think we haven't talked about elsewhere in the league, and I, I, there's a mixture here of, you know, both NBA Euros coming over, which will be the main focus of our third th third section where we're discussing why we're seeing so much of it, and also, uh, you know, some of the EuroLeague to EuroLeague moves, which I think are huge. So, Usman Garuba, back to Real Madrid. To me, you know, okay, one thing we all thought was going to happen a summer earlier, but he decided to try one more year in the NBA. Good for Usman, I say to that. But uh, Usman's back, and I think we'd have been talking about it more, particularly in the context of all the roster reshuffling in Madrid, had there not been all this other noise around it. The same especially goes for one of the big EuroLeague to EuroLeague transfers, Wade Baldwin IV from Maccabi, obviously to Fenerbahce. Like, Baldwin, you know, had easily his best year in his professional basketball career to date last season and was certainly extremely coveted by many, many, many teams. But again, Wade, while a huge move and a great signing for Fenerbahce, 
probably not as discussed as others. Now, part of this as well, I will say, is that Fenner did a lot of their business really early, and Bowman was a late move, and so that kind of cut us all off guard uh, a little bit. Uh, Lorenzo Brown, also from Maccabi to Panathinaikos. And again, with Pau, it's a case of, yeah, but then they had the year save and the shady thing. Of course, we're going to talk about Lorenzo Brown a bit less. But again, that's a kind of interesting move in terms of what it means for Pau on the floor. Uh, Cody Miller McIntyre going to Zvezda, like... McIntyre had a phenomenal season for Basconia last year. Changed the backcourt dynamic of Zvezda overnight. Like, that's huge. And again, not too much discussed about. Theo Maladon to Asval. You might go, come on, that isn't as big as the other ones we're listing off here. But, like, he, you know, was such a huge prospect coming over from France to the NBA. He's come back because he thinks it's his best place for him to get back going in basketball, to restart his career in many respects. And he feels Asval is the best place he can do that. That, to me, is interesting. An honourable mention, entirely because he is first all-name EuroLeague, Admiral Schofield, uh, coming over. Obviously, Orlando Magic Man, now with um, Asvel as well. It took me a second to remember where he'd signed. Sorry, Admiral. Uh, so, yeah, and of course, the most overlooked for me, though, is none of those, and... Most of you will say, apart from Admiral, maybe not as big a deal. Arthur Zagars, because we're only about a year and a bit, you know, or a year removed from him opening our eyes to his potential at the World Cup. Then obviously he went off to BC Wolves, he had his injury and all that, but he's finally coming to Yearly proper again with uh, Fenerbahce again. So yeah, it's again, Fenner did their business really early, including bringing Arthur's back. And the one off-court one, which again, I feel we'd have talked about a lot more had there been not so much going on, is uh, Tuomas Isalo uh, leaving uh, Paris for an NBA job. The guy wins the BCL up on, then wins Euro Cup with Paris basketball. His stock is on the rise so much that he's already gone to the US and his replacement is Thiago Splitter. Like, that would have been a much bigger story had there not been so many things happening. Like that, And I, what I'm saying is all of these signings were covered. Like, you go on the major news basketball sites, they're there. I'm talking about us having the discussion. Like, those of us who are, you know, big about talking about basketball every day of our lives, and even the casual observers who like to talk basketball a bit, there was too much to consume here. And it was almost like we missed some of the better stories in terms of the off-season moves. Like, it's huge, it's crazy, it's noisy. Why is there so much of it? So, there's a couple of factors here that have led to this sheer flurry of activity. Uh, one that's smaller than some of you think and bigger than others of you think, so probably somewhere in the middle in terms of its actual influence. The NIL is a factor because it means more European players are considering going over to the US, even though they can't get NIL money directly in the US as young college students. There are ways around it, as we've seen colleges do, playing games outside of the US to mysteriously have sponsorship deals, etc., uh, for players. But it also basically means that more young talent is considering the NCAA route now than was before. So at that level, there are fewer guys. Again, for some of you, you might think that isn't that important. Fair. Others might think it's really important. Also fair. I think there is a level of importance because when we talk about the volume, the sheer volume of transfers, it's definitely a factor in there. But the biggest uh, two things are the unofficial tiers that we've sort of seen develop in EuroLeague and the sheer format of EuroLeague itself. So with the unofficial tiers, I'm talking about the absolute elite at the top, like the five clubs who are willing to go out there and get their guys. Real Madrid have kind of been doing that bit longer than the rest, which is why they didn't have to go out there quite as much, but they have been doing that. They're in that conversation. Fenerbahce, Monaco, Olympiacos, Panathinaikos. They're all going out there because they feel that they must spend to win. And, of course, for them, Final Four, all five of those teams, is feeling like, you know, uh, uh, something they ought to be in every season, as in they ought to be there, they belong there in their view. And they are trying to spend as though they believe that they should be leaving no doubt in that respect, even though, of course, those who you can do basic arithmetic know, at most, four of the f uh, f four of those Final Four teams, uh, of those teams, sorry, can be in the Final Four, five can't. So, naturally, someone's going to get some disappointed fans. But... The format, of course, does not mean that the top four of the table go to the final four. We have play-ins and we have play-offs. That means there's five other spots for, you know, I'd say about ten other teams to aim at to get a shot at getting to the final four and potentially winning it all. Because, of course, final four is single elimination. So if you can somehow get through one series against one opponent who in theory outmatches you, but you could find a way to do it over three or five games, you have 
an even better potential chance because you're in pure single elimination, where there's more ch more element of chance, so to speak. So that's the thing. Many more believe they can win if they spend a bit more than they're currently spending. And so that's led to this sort of, you know, this elite and haves. To me, there's the elite, the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots right now are uh, pretty clear in my mind. I'm going to say exactly who they are in my Power Rankings video, which is coming out soon. But if you can't guess, I mean, like, come on, folks, come on. You can you can guess who I mean. There's three teams in it. And um, there are three teams I don't expect to be contending for the uh, play-ins, never mind the playoffs. And, uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's like just so much news, so much stories. And... It's not going to end here uh, because we've seen in-season moves happen before. I mentioned Kendrick Nunn in a previous video. I'm going to mention him again. He wasn't there at the start of last season. He came in. Like, as we get nearer the start of the NBA season, there's certainly going to be more noises of who's available and who's a good fit and who might work. And also, don't forget, uh, Danilo Gallinari still hasn't got a job yet. Now, he seems wedded to the US, but if you are a yearly GM who suddenly realized that Danilo Gallinari doesn't have a job yet, and Danilo Gallinari could do a job for you, don't call me. I have no idea. I, I don't know Danilo personally, but do check out the quality of golf courses in your area and find championship level ones. That's the one bit of advice there. But there's the thing. There's, even, there's pieces on the board we wouldn't have considered a month ago, or at least six weeks ago, because pieces on the board that were, you know, closer to what we weren't considering but then Shetty becomes available Ferkman makes that move Boban comes home uh, guys we thought weren't going to finish their careers in Europe would just you know happily ease out in the US uh, you know they did that so listen the battery's about to go in this camera so I better stop recording but listen as ever please subscribe to the channel and if you haven't already tell your friends show the love and I will see you soon